it falls to me to, um, to give uh, his introduction, and I don't really know any um, uh, stories about Ian except to say that uh, he has um, been a great uh, co-organizer co for this workshop, and it's been a real pleasure to get to know him and, and to see uh, how he's built the Computation Institute and how it's really seems to me to be insinuated into so many important uh, problems and areas of work in the university. So without further ado, welcome. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to tell you what I do with data. Um, so I'm not going to give a general talk about the Computation Institute because I think we've heard from quite a few uh, people who are engaged there already. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about something very specific and, and, uh, and, and uh, quite different from what people have been talking about previously, which is the work w we do uh, in my uh, group on technologies for uh, sharing and analyzing large quantities of data. Um, so, uh, so the University of Chicago, Northwestern University, sorry, uh, New York uh, University, and, uh, and the US Census. Um, but I'll start off with some introductory material on, on other sorts of uh, data sharing uh, um, concerns. But, but I thought in, in keeping with uh, Andre's presentation, I should start with a picture of an old person. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is Tycho Brahe, um, even older than the, the woman uh, that we saw earlier, but he did lived longer. So with two data points, we've got a, enough to draw a graph there, I guess. But he's interesting. I, I bring him up just because he, you know, I think uh, he's going to illustrate some of the the, the changes in, in, in data that we, we're seeing. So he spent uh, something like 40 years building an astronomical observatory and measuring the position of, of uh, 777 stars with uh, great precision uh, for, for the time. Um, you know, now, of course, uh, you know, fast forward um, 500 years or so, and uh, you know, we've got large-scale digital sky surveys which are transforming astronomy. And so this is a... How many here know about the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, except for Bob, so uh, he knows about it, of course. But uh, this is actually a rather old-fashioned survey by now, but you know, in a few years they were able to measure the position of 230 million uh, celestial objects, galaxies and, and uh, stars and so forth, and, and obviously in the process transform uh, uh, biology and uh, transform astronomy. And in the process, I mean, just mention you know, from this one data set, more than 6,000, actually, at this point, peer-reviewed publications uh, resulted. Uh, and to give a biological example, here's uh, someone we all know, um, Janet Rowley. You know, so back in 1972, with a uh, fairly small amount of data, I guess a few kilobytes, you know, was able to, uh, which she gathered uh, by applying a new technique at the time, she was able to establish the genetic basis of cancer. And, you know, now, of course, we, we know that... Uh, the rate of generation of biological data is uh, increasing. Um, I hate this, uh, this uh, present presentation mode. is increasingly dramatically. So this is the way computer scientists think about the world. You know that for uh, decades now, you know the cost of computing has been decreasing exponentially. So this is a, a log plot on the uh, the left side. Um, you know there's some concern now that it's stopping. Decreasing, which is a topic for another a conversation, but here is a, on, on a uh, equivalent, uh, at least log scale, the cost of sequencing the human genome, which, as we all know, started off at about um, you know 100 million dollars, or actually more than that for the first one, I guess, and, and then uh, you know has now uh, been increasingly f decreasing far more rapidly than, uh, than than Moore's law, down with the latest data from. Uh, 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 NIH to uh, just a bit more than a thousand dollars, but perhaps uh, some say poised to decline further uh, precipitously. Um, so, you know, in both of two different fields, where you know suddenly the uh, the, the challenge uh, that researchers face is not is no longer uh, how to get data, but what to do with vast amounts of data, and. Uh, I know if uh, Robert was here, he would now tell me, that, tell me that the data that we're talking about may not always be of the same quality of the data that we had before, but nevertheless it's there and one can perhaps do interesting things with it. So uh, this is my uh, picture of the data deluge that uh, we're all uh, dealing with. Um, I don't know the source of the data except it came from the internet, but it's, uh, I think it does, 
captured delightfully. So these are astronomers here, and these are public policy researchers. Perhaps they're not quite, uh, not quite wet yet. So, but an interesting, so now bringing up a theme that I think Bob referred to, you know, exponentials are, are wonderful, uh, but also strange things. If you, you know, as, as data volumes, compute power increases exponentially, in a sense, just by investing at a constant rate, oh, you, your capability increases uh, exponentially as well, which is, you know, a wonderful thing. Our computers are far faster than they were uh, ten, 10 years ago. But there's also this other uh, aspect to it, which is if you don't do anything, then your relative capability to everyone else decreases exponentially. Um, and I think in a sense that's a challenge that uh, the, many of the sciences uh, face. You know, it, it used to be that uh, if you wanted to do some genomic science, you would, well, you'd have to do some work in your lab and obtain a few genes and you could uh, do some work with them. I mean, it used to be a PhD thesis was to sequence one, uh, one gene. Now you need uh, something comparable to the genomic data commons in order to acquire and accumulate and process uh, all of the data that you have available to, so, to you. So, so we need a new class of uh, infrastructure, more of a community infrastructure uh, that will allow more people to work on large quantities of data. Um, so how do you assemble these uh, infrastructures? So one, I'll just give one pointer to a project I was involved in. Um, the uh, Large Hadron Collider, some of you have heard of it, you know, dis discovered the Higgs boson. So we got involved early on in building out some of the uh, so-called grid computing infrastructure that was used to analyze the data from the Higgs boson. And the way this community worked was physicists are a rather odd bunch. They didn't build a big central facility. They got everyone, everyone participating, every institution participating to contribute computers and storage. Uh, ultimately, hundreds of institutions with uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of CPUs uh, all linked together in a big distributed computing system to analyze the data from uh, the LHC and ultimately discover uh, this, uh, well, determine an approximate mass of this Higgs boson-like uh, like particle. But that's, uh, most of the communities that we work in, I think, don't have the same uh, global uh, sense of organization. Uh, and so perhaps we need to uh, pursue uh, different approaches. So let me uh, give one other example uh, of uh, approaches that people are taking to dealing with, uh, with big data. So we heard about the Genomics Data Commons, which is a very large project for very large quantities of nationally sourced data. Uh, another sort of smaller scale, but I think also interesting example at Argonne National Lab is the metagenomics uh, uh, sequence analysis uh, server. So this is a, a service run by a, a small team. Um, it, uh, what does it do? Well, if you have a metagenomics sample, you know, a, a piece of an, a collection of environmental sequence data from, a collection of sequence data from uh, an environmental sample, you can upload it to this uh, system. It will uh, perform uh, some fairly sophisticated analyses, uh, call genes uh, on your sample, and send you uh, the results back uh, within a few hours. Uh, and as someone in, in uh, Mexico told me once, you know, this allowed them to enter this field. If they'd wanted to enter this field of metagenomics, they w otherwise would have had to probably spend $100,000 or more, spend six months learning how to install appropriate software, uh, hire someone with expertise that was hard to find, and, and basically, uh, you know, prohibitively, uh, uh, for them at least, prohibitive costs uh, to, to proceed in this area. But they were able to pursue this uh, research thanks to, thanks to the service. And interestingly, you know, this is a somewhat, a few months old slide, but when I took it, they have, they'd collected 252,000 metagenomic samples with, uh, what is a more than 100 uh, tera base pairs of data. So it's also, it's sort of a positive return to scale. Um, as more contributions are made, they can improve the quality uh, of the service. Um, the one way in which it's not a positive return to scale is uh, in the, uh, the money required to keep it running. And I, I think uh, we, Bob met, referred to this earlier, the little piggy bank. Um, I don't think there's necessarily been uh, 
appropriately constructed for this system, but that's uh, a, a topic for a perhaps later discussion. Okay, so in this area of massively growing data, um, data being produced on large scales by people around the world and then consumed by, by people, people trying to create these central services like MGRAST or GDC or other things. Uh, we, uh, myself, uh, Ravi Maduri, who's here, and uh, others in, our, in, the, in what we call the Globus team, recognized there was a need for services that would help to manage the flow of data um, around uh, the country, around the world, and, and so forth. And so that led to uh, us to establish a, a project uh, to build out a set of cloud-hosted research data management services called Globus, um, actually building off technology that was originally used for the Large Hadron Collider uh, physics data analysis, but focusing on the needs of small labs who uh, and, and small communities, small to medium-sized communities, rather than massive physics collaborations, who uh, have a need to be able to manage the flow of what you know used to be maybe little spreadsheets uh, but now is gigabytes or even terabytes you know as data is produced by simulation sequencing machines telescopes uh, other facilities and flows through uh, national or global networks um, ultimately we hope resulting in, in discoveries we've uh, we started this latest the latest version of this project about six years ago and at this point we've we have a service that uh, large numbers of people use, so we have more than 30,000 registered users. Um, they've moved 180 petabytes, 25 billion files have been transferred, lots of fun facts uh, like that. 10,000 storage systems around the world, most major research universities in the US and labs, many sequencing centers run uh, Globus endpoints. Um, uh, which means that you can connect to your web browser and move data from one place to another, uh, share data with others, um, and uh, perform various other things such as publish data, obtain digital object identifiers, and so forth, uh, with a, uh, extremely easily. So that's one of the things that uh, we spend our time uh, uh, doing. It's a mix of research on the computer science side, but also very much running um, a production service for the research community. And we have a very good group of uh, uh, well, engineers, uh, architects, uh, um, support staff, and so forth, who keep this system running. And we're, we've, we've been very concerned about this issue of sustainability for, for this uh, service, because so many people now depend on it. So one approach we've, we're pursuing to sustainability is to get institutions to subscribe uh, to various premium services. So anyone can use much of this for free, but some, uh, well, it's now up to about 40 research uh, universities subscribe to get access to some nice management services, in some cases, and in some cases just because they like, like what we're doing, I, I think. Um, so I'll give you a few examples. Well, so this Globus, uh, these Globus services, which I'm not going to say much more about, but they allow individuals to uh, manage the flow of data, but increasingly they're being used to build research data portals, things like the MGRAS system that I showed you, systems that are designed to make data available to a, to a community. So I'll give you a few examples of some of the systems of that sort that have been built. Um, they're not all biological, uh, and well, for better or worse, we work with many different uh, disciplines. So the National Center for Atmospheric Research um, runs something called the Research Data Archive, which has uh, many thousands of data sets of different sorts, both simulation data sets and observational, I guess a few experimental data sets as well. Um, and uh, they face the challenge of making that data available to uh, tens of thousands of people uh, around the world. So they have built this portal on top of these global services. So we manage uh, access control to their data. Uh, we uh, manage how data is delivered to people um, and, and various uh, other things. Um, the, U the US uh, Department of Energy runs something called the Systems Biology Knowledge Base, which is something rather like the MGRAS system. It accumulates 
uh, data of a variety of types relating to the system's biology, primarily of bacteria, but also uh, plants. You know, this relates to some of uh, DOE, uh, DOE's missions, uh, goals such as uh, better biofuels, uh, better uh, biochemical re reactors, and, and so forth. And again, they build on this uh, technology that, that we've been developing. Um, and this is one I just found recently. Uh, the, the Sanger Institute in the UK runs an imputation service. So if you get your 23andMe data, which you can actually get a VCF file with the, your genome, uh, your SNPs, I guess, and, uh, which is not very meaningful, but if you upload it to this service, which is, builds on this Globus infrastructure, you can get back a whole lot of additional data, which doesn't seem very meaningful either. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it is to some of the people in this room. Yeah. I know Nancy Cox, before she left, she always promised that she would process my uh, 23 and Me data for me, but I, I never got around to asking her to do it so that I would know what was, uh, what was wrong with me. So anyway. Um, Oh yes, and one last uh, thing we're, we've, that uh, we, it builds on what we're doing, the materials data facility, which is a community resource for uh, materials science data, which is probably of no interest to uh, anyone here. Okay, oh yes, yeah, so I have one last uh, thing I want to mention in terms of our current activities. So, uh, and this is a, a project led by Ravi Maduri here. Um, so, you know, ac providing access to data, all the projects I've just described to you provide, allow people to access a, a website, uh, well so, some of them anyway, the, the Research Data Archive for example and KBase allow you to access a data, a, a website uh, and then um, download uh, data that you know, fits your needs. But of course, um, you know, it doesn't ultimately make sense in many situations to uh, force people to download data to their own computer, which may often lack the, ca the capacity to uh, perform the analysis that, that they, will need, they want to be able to do, especially as data volumes uh, grow. So we want, and we see emerging from you know, various projects, uh, an increasing uh, range of services in which people upload data uh, to have analysis performed for them. So the Sanger imputation service uh, is a small scale example of that. Uh, but what we'd also like, of course, is to allow people to run arbitrary computations on, on that data. So where is it going to be performed? Um, well, one uh, place that fits a, a nice niche, perhaps between the petabyte and the, and the, uh, and the, ter and the megabyte, uh, is to use um, cloud computing services, such as those provided by Amazon or, or Microsoft. So is anyone, everyone here is familiar with cloud computing? It's, uh, it's the answer to all the world's problems, along with deep, deep learning. Uh, deep learning. So, no, so this is a, Amazon, as you all know, is a bookseller in, in uh, Seattle. Um, but it, it, it led, it was a pioneer in, in what has become a very uh, major uh, business of providing on-demand access to computing. So uh, uh, with uh, a fairly simple set of web interfaces, you can ask Amazon to give you access to a computer, actually something called a virtual machine on which you can run whatever program you may want to run. You can ask Amazon to give you some storage place in which you can store uh, things. And quite a, a number of particularly smaller labs end up using those sorts of resources to do some of their computing, uh, at least. If you don't have access to a powerful research computing center or uh, you know, center for research informatics, uh, like the University of Chicago provides, it can be useful to, to be able to reach out there and, and do your computing at relatively low cost. So geno Globus Genomics is, um, is, a, is a, I think it started out as an experiment, but be has become a very successful demonstration of how you can take this on-demand computing provided by uh, the likes of Amazon and use it to deliver capabilities uh, to uh, uh, relatively you know, unsophisticated from a computational perspective, uh, researchers. And here's a, a slide that sort of shows how it works um, in, in practice. This is uh, a slide put together by one of uh, Ravi's collaborators at the University of Kansas Medical Center. You know, so uh, we, uh, 
this is sort of a, a workflow that I think is becoming quite common. Um, you know, an investigator obtains some uh, biological samples. They send them off to a sequencing center using FedEx, I guess, or equivalent. Um, this often might be an external sequencing center, in fact. Uh, the uh, sequencing center delivers the results directly to this uh, cloud computing center, uh, Amazon. So the big data files that you know, otherwise might clutter up your desktop just get delivered directly to the cloud. Globus Genomics runs some potentially complex uh, workflow. It may use hundreds or thousands of computers, uh, but it only uses them for a short time, so it doesn't cost uh, too much. And then the results are returned to the researcher, perhaps to a local computing facility or perhaps uh, to their local lab. And uh, well, I ideally, of course, we hope that uh, discoveries um, result. It says new discovery. I don't know what an old discovery would be. I guess that's the one that uh, you make and then realize that someone else had already done it uh, before. So, yeah. Anyway, so I think this is a, you know, a really interesting model for how uh, one may increasingly do, do computing. And underpinning this all is this Globus data movement service that I, I mentioned earlier. Okay, so... Um, maybe I'll skip over that. So, oh, well, I'll mention... This is one more example of things that we're doing at the University of Chicago, and it may be of interest to some. So uh, this is an activity primarily based on the Harris School, but involving the Computation Institute, a system called Planario. It's, again, an Amazon cloud-hosted uh, database, uh, in this case with large amounts of public data from the city of Chicago. Uh, there's uh, other versions of it that host data from other cities. Um, the uh, Yeah, so you can... I've selected Chicago here, but I could select, I think, also San Francisco and a few other places. And you can see it's pretty neat. You can select a region, find out what, uh, uh, well, there's uh, energy audit data, crime stats. Um, obviously, I didn't do the search uh, here. I think I just entered the, in, went to the default page. So it's giving me information from Austin and uh, Bristol in the UK. But if you zoomed in, you would get data on a particular geographic region. Okay, so now I wanted to turn to the topic of the title of the talk fairly quickly. So um, everything we've done so far run what involves data centers of various sorts, some university centers, often, as I've said, uh, commercial cloud centers. Um, it's not suitable at the present for data that is uh, you know, subject to uh, regulations such as HIPAA or, or other things. So we've recently started a project um, to build out what we call a safe data platform, which is uh, still cloud hosted, but leverages uh, fairly various advances in governance and privacy protection to enable uh, uh, the use of these systems for, uh, for uh, you know, federal data. For example, US census data, which is one uh, set of data we're going to be working with. But the ultimate goal of this activity is to uh, as I'll say a bit of more about at the end if I have time, is to bring together data from many federal agencies to encourage uh, evidence-based policy uh, making. And this is uh, a topic of interest because of the, you know, the recent, uh, one of the, I think maybe the only bipartisan legislation that passed this year, um, uh, you know, the Evidence-Based Policy Making Commission uh, Act, which you know, aims to uh, encourage and enable uh, evidence-based policy making. And I know that some people from the University of Chicago are involved in this and know much more about it than, than I do. So I will go on. So uh, a set of uh, principles for building out a safe data platform. Are these familiar to people here? I'm told that they are well-known phrases, although I haven't come across them before. So, but uh, safe, safe people, um, you know, making sure you control who has access to a, uh, highly control who has access to the platform. Um, auditing the projects themselves, I guess that's akin to IRB uh, approvals, uh, building highly secure environments, safe settings, and then controlling the outputs uh, that come out of whatever analyses that may be performed uh, on this um, uh, computing platform. So historically, these things have been done often by having uh, you know, air-gapped you know, rooms that you need to go to, perform it, uh, to perform analysis. Uh, the uh, NORC uh, you know, pioneered some approaches based on uh, online access to uh, 
privileged uh, uh, locations. Now we uh, plan to take that further and, and uh, at least for some classes of data, uh, enable access uh, on, on using cloud resources. So this is the basic uh, you know, approach that we are uh, building. You know, the, the model is you know, data is delivered by data providers. Um, for example, the, the Census or the Bureau of Labor Statistics or others. Um, there may be a, often I think in the early stages, maybe forever there will be some amount of de-identification that occurs at this point. Then there's a cleanup metadata extraction process, publication into a registry, um, and then a process by which uh, researchers, authorized safe researchers can come in, um, discover data, request access, uh, uh, and then uh, create um, uh, perhaps from an archive of, uh, or a repository of uh, previously vetted or um, you know, popular analysis packages, uh, stand up a, using a technology called containers. It's, a, it's another computer science um, um, phrase that's popular at the moment, but start up a secure computation to perform analysis uh, on, on the data. Um, so that's all pretty standard stuff. It's what you might do if you were working on your desktop. The difference is, of course, this is done in a controlled environment where you can expand the amount of computing that you have available as needed, uh, and furthermore can uh, uh, push the results of your analysis back into the into the what you might call the commons, you know, the, the safe safe commons. I think this making this cycle, closing the loop on this cycle, is really what's vital to uh, enabling. Uh, this sort of collaborative, um, and allowing communities to, to uh, build on the results of each other. You know, so ideally, you know, the tables of the, the wonderful tables and graphs of the sort that Andre was producing would go back into this sort of uh, system and then other people might build analyses that would uh, build on top of those results. So uh, we work with a, a a colleague called Julia Lane at NYU who uh, has, uh, I guess she reads a lot and so she uses Amazon and she loves the idea of building into this system some recommendation uh, engine and because she spoke so much about this, one of my colleagues, Charlie Catlett, put this picture together, you know, conveying the, some of the goals of the project. She, he calls it Julia-zon uh, by analogy with uh, Amazon but, you know, so whether, you know, can, can we, to what extent can we do this? Given a system like this, can you come in and start to be told, well, the, the data you've just viewed, there are other data sets that are, that are similar. Um, here's new data that just arrived that's similar to data you've used in the past. Um, you know, these are the analyses that people have applied to the data that you just looked at. Um, you know, here's a, a, a recipe, an a, a analysis pipeline uh, that's similar to the one that you just created. Um, interesting I mean, challenge that we've done work like this in the past. In fact, uh, Ravi and I have published papers on this, but here we're going to be working with highly sensitive data, so I think there are going to be interesting issues, you know, managing authorization of what you show people uh, and deciding what is similar, what is not similar, uh, and so forth. But I think there's a lot that can be, uh, can be done there. We already have a prototype of this up and running. Um, I'll just show you a few slides. So here's a, a search. Um, actually, I don't know if I'm, I'm just listing some things. This is uh, not um, sensitive uh, or it's, I think, a bunch of climate data actually with rather not very helpful metadata saying this is uh, s annual precipitation, I think, uh, from 2091 to 2099 from a climate model simulation. Um, but if you look on the right, you'll see some of the elements of a safe data platform. You can uh, given uh, a data set, you can request access if access is controlled. This lock is open, so you don't need to do it. You can download it or you can add it to your workspace. Once you've added it to your workspace, um, you can go in and do things like uh, uh, save it, delete it, or launch a, 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 what's something called a Jupyter Notebook. Has anyone here used IPython or Jupyter? These are so the, the three computer scientists in the room. Are, are, Oh, I guess, and the physicists reveal themselves. Yes, right. Yes, right. <laughs> but this is a very popular and actually quite wonderful technology for uh, wrapping up um, uh, 
collections that you can use it to wrap Python code or R code or uh, maybe even SPSS code. I, I'm not sure about that, but uh, uh, in a way that is easy for someone else to uh, to review and and uh, and study. So if I click the create a Python notebook, uh, uh, create the Jupyter notebook here. Here I've done it for a, a Python code, and it'll la launch. It'll don't look at the details, but it will start up with code that can access the data that I've just uh, selected and, and start performing analyses uh, on it using perhaps uh, you know, the, the latest uh, techniques for avoiding uh, bias uh, that as just developed by Robert um, here. Okay, so, uh, so that's um, you know, what, what our current focus. I, I, meant I wanted to take the opportunity to mention it here because I figure that it seems relevant to what you're doing in your particular project, and and I think uh, if we are successful in this effort with uh, the census and others, we we might have a unique capability um, uh, that at the University of Chicago that we could uh, start to uh, make use of in, in other fields. And I wanted to finish up with one final thing. Uh, a you know, I think a challenge when you have new data types and therefore new methods uh, and, and a need for new knowledge. Uh, a challenge that one faces is how do you engage people in learning about and uh, you know, creating communities around the use of this, uh, this data. So one thing that uh, we, uh, the University of Chicago, the Computation Institute, the Harris School and others uh, contributed to was uh, a class, uh, this was actually uh, a series of, it's a fairly, you know, it's a formal, not quite degree granting, but certificate granting course on big data and social science for the statistical agencies, uh, which we ran, we've run twice now, we'll be running it again in the, in the winter. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea of this class is you combine lectures on, uh, and, and then a lot of practical exercises on a funny mix of it may seem, I think you might find it a funny mix of, you know, things like web scraping. You know, how do you get access to non-traditional data sources by scraping web pages, which is not something that statistical agencies traditionally do. Uh, text analysis, you know, for analyzing things like, uh, uh, you know, full text documents of, uh, of patents, one of the areas of interest here, or, or Twitter feeds of... Uh, if you're looking at trying to analyze the spread of information uh, and innovative ideas and in science, network analysis, um, statistical inference, um, security and privacy, and all of these uh, things here with supporting Jupyter notebooks with code that they can execute. And we just, uh, having taught that once, we then turned it into a, a book, which we just came out this week actually, or last week, uh, which well, I think it's an interesting mix of practice and theory uh, focused on, on, the, um, on this particular community. But the book is not the point. I think the point is we might want to think about doing something similar uh, as a means of engaging new ways of thinking about how to use some of these uh, new, uh, new data types. Um, where we want to go in the future with this is start to tie together some of the work that's going on with Planario, which is focused on city data, and uh, this work on the safe data platform, which is focused on you know government and agency data, and start to bring the two together. There seems to be a lot of uh, potential um, to uh, link uh, different safe data platforms, uh, you know, using ideas perhaps similar to those uh, that uh, Bob presented on. Uh, you need to identify us for data. Uh, the ability to share data in a way that uh, is secure and you know preserves audit trails and, and other things, and hopefully uh, uh, in, enable some uh, new uh, approaches to data-driven uh, policy. So thank you very much. Yeah. Curious whether you could talk a bit about your experience in getting different communities to agree on things like, for example, uh, the interfaces. So the that you have a common interface, a common way of exchanging data. 
Yeah, so that's uh, always uh, incredibly difficult. So, uh, well, you know, so, standard, so standards are essential to communication at some level, and, uh, and, uh, but people hate them. And, and so we can see from you know, historic history when you've got to get to the, reduce the friction and increase the, the benefit. So you know, the, the web occurred because Tim Berners-Lee managed to work out how to reduce the friction associated with sharing data. And people loved sharing data so much that everyone started putting up a, a web page. Um, when it comes to uh, statistical agency data, you know, not so much, I, I guess. So, so the approach, I think part of what we're doing here is um, in, in these classes, people, uh, so the, the head of the census wants his people to participate, and they have to have some data to work on. So he's prepared to provide some of their data into this safe harbor in order to enable the class to proceed. So in a sense, people are being encouraged to bring data as part of the, uh, the practical exercise. And in the process of doing the class, they realize the benefits that may result from it. So perhaps that's one uh, way of um, uh, encouraging participation. It's not, it's not really based around uh, common interfaces at all. It's based around a common place to put, put the data. Yeah. I assume it's not just a binary decision as to whether a system is safe or not. So yeah. I'm wondering how much work has to go into defining different notions of safety and, and maybe even some, uh, some tests that a system would have to satisfy to, to gain a certain level of safety. Yeah, no, indeed, that's, uh, there are, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and are you working on that? Yeah. So you're going to tell us how it works. And that's, of course, a, a, both a technical and a political uh, issue. So, uh, you know, the National Institutes for Standards and Technology has put effort into describing you know, so-called FedRAMP uh, standards uh, for uh, uh, determining and uh, verifying safety. And so uh, partly a technical and partly a political answer to that is that we are working to make our system FedRAMP compliant. But that is not really uh, the answer. I, I think the... Ideally, you'd build systems that um, have more sophisticated measures of safety uh, and uh, and mechanisms for uh, determining, you know, when when safety might be about to be compromised. Uh, auditing, uh, you know, trust but verify, many approaches like that. And you may might want to involve social scientists and in, in these, perhaps philosophers as well in these uh, in these discussions. I, mean, I think ultimately, you know, Bob and others raise this question of. You know, what are the trade-offs between our currently quite draconian laws on data dissemination and uh, and the benefits to society that would result from uh, from broader dissemination? So they are not just technical and political, but also legal uh, issues to be pursued. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, Julia Lane has some interesting things, and my co colleague here on, on this, um, you know, she has interesting things to say about uh, you know, acceptable use as, as well. She thinks you know, this, this whole notion of uh, consent is ultimately a meaningless thing, because how can you really determine what every person who's giving you data is consenting to? So you need you know, technical and perhaps legal frameworks in which uh, access can be, can be managed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I used to. People used to come to me uh, when I was first in the CI, and they said, "I have big data. Can you help me?" And I, and I, I had a simple test. I would say, "Will it fit on my iPhone?" And if it fitted on my iPhone, then I said, "It's not really big." And it's not a very serious comment. But back then, it was, I guess, 10 gigabytes, and now it's 60 gigabytes. Um, where did you get the 170 petabytes from? Uh, For a slide, I okay. No, I probably did say that somewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Oh yeah, I see. Yeah, that slide. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. this is how much people have moved with Globus. Um, yes. And, yeah. And that's that's why I was asking. I, I'm and it's tens I'm of thousands of people are moving it. The biggest transfer that we've managed so far is one petabyte, and that was uh, I think the LIGO gravitational wave uh, experiment, taking their data in California and deciding that maybe they should have a backup on on the East Coast. And the lo the longest single data transfer was three months. Yeah. I trust that. Is that is that a petabyte? I'm Actually, it was less. I think that was um, data moving, mo data being moved from a, a tape storage system at one supercomputer center that was being decommissioned to another tape store system at another supercomputer center. Yeah. So, so it was the tape storage on yeah. and off that was the that was the bottleneck. I trust. Yeah, and actually, it sped up quite a bit over time because we realized that. The, the, the performance of a tape storage system depends a, a great deal on how you sequence your, your reads. And so we learned how to order the reads. Um, and uh, th anyway, that's getting into too much detail. Yeah. But yeah, some of this, uh, you know, there's you know, so-called big data. You know, there's, it comes in, I think one can probably categorize things into, into groups. There's data that works fine on your desktop with uh, you know, s contemporary tools. There's, Data that isn't really that big, but needs a few terabytes and a few hundreds of cores, and that's you know for that something like a, a local research computing center or a cloud may be be fine. And then there's the data that's tens of or many petabytes, and there you need a national facility to store it. You know, and the, the genomics data commons or other such systems are perhaps what one needs to create. So, so can you imagine a time when it will only make sense to have one? really big computer and one really big hard disk um, or whatever. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I think people have written science fiction books about that. But no, no, but there's, there's an interesting, so uh, data is, um, you know, data, I, mean, I think this is a very, very interesting topic to discuss. Data is constantly being created in different places in different ways. and. It, you know, data has a half, often has a half-life, and so it's a very dynamic system. So data is often in the wrong place, and it, for various reasons you need to bring it together, um, you know, concentrate it to ask one set of questions. Over time, the set of questions you, you want to answer will change, so the data that needs to be concentrated will be different. Um, so apart from the one copy of all the data in the world that the National Security Agency maintains for us, uh, I think there won't be any other such facility. <laughs> 